Hello there and welcome to yet another edition of the audio narration of Civilization Battle Royale. I am Dawkins and I will be narrating for you for part 24. Hi there, I'm so glad you could join me today. Welcome to part 24 of, you guessed it, the Civ Battle Royale. I'm your host, Curly Snell, part-time Poland bar painter, procrastinator, and propaganda propagator for the Babylonian Observer. Of course, I'd like to thank T-Pang for bringing us to the Battle Royale itself and for kindly allowing me to write this part. I shall not disappoint. And without further ado, we shall begin. Ah, I lied. There is more ado to do here. Here is the wonderful map of the world on turn 271, made by Cylon L, with cities added by Laxaraxariskal. I really like the pirated names of the buccaneer land holdings. The Galar Bagos never fails to make me chuckle and mumble it out loud. We begin this part with a look into the mighty Inuit homeland. Although at war with the Snorriaks, Akunik, Inuit, decides to hold the majority of the ice sheet fleet back in the icy waters of Alaska. The Inuit have a strong looking navy, one certainly not to be toyed with, though unlike the top drop bear, Australia, their navy is still rocking some galleuses. Akunik needs to invest some more ice gold into his navy, lest the war with the Yaks may grind to a slow and snowy halt. Ask Hitler, a slow winter war is never good, and in Yakland, it's always winter. Moving on to a slightly more deserty environment, we see the mismatched army of Tibet on the brink of capturing the Timurid city of Urgench. Not only do Tibet have a swordsman, they also have long swordsmen, some pikemen, and some muskets, not to mention them fielding cannons alongside composite bowmen. Timer does not seem too bothered by this, having most of his army along his southern border. There's not too much he can do here, though, as Orgench is only accessible through a one-tile mountain pass. It's also interesting to note that Songxian has chosen not to use his Himalayan cavalry, which are incredibly fast in hills. Having many of these could potentially end his campaign in the rocky regions of Timurid land much quicker. Ekinik decides he's fed up with Sitting Bull, what's left of the Sioux city, taking up all of them tasty snow tiles and declares war. There aren't many Inuit units in the area, however, and naval attacks are limited to one tile. This tile, of course, is being blocked by the Maple Flotilla of Lester B. Pearson, of Canada, himself. The fascist Finns decide that their north is truer than the Inuit and declare an irrelevant war, making nobody happy nor sad. Speaking of Finland, the top cat Kekkonen continues his assault on Poland, pushing on from Rokla to Warsaw. Their army looks to be thinning out on the front lines, though their reserves in the north seem ready to go, itching to deny Poland into space. Not just outer space, mind you, any space at all. The Polish are also getting battered by Leonidas of Sparta, his army of pikes and knights being fended off by a single composite bowman and a crossbow. Poland's days look sadly numbered. By the Franco-Porto Nazi border, we have the grouchiest great general ever to have lived. He's probably peeved off at the fact that not only does Cologne not belong to France, but it belongs to Maria of all people. Also note the number of Swedish and Norwegian troops near Hamburg, and the almost complete lack of German troops around to defend it. Elizabeth of England, as if she needs more enemies, declares war on Morocco, perhaps a deluded decision formed on her desperate belief that Britain really does have a worldwide empire and everyone else is just lying. More likely, it's just begging Ahmad to put her out of her misery. He probably could too if the Portuguese navy wasn't in the way. Also, he looks like the kind of guy that could do it too. Something about his stare. Australian holdings in Champa's back garden look dangerously undefended. If they moved quickly, then they could possibly take a few small cities from them before the thunder is heard, and the Wapagong Armada comes crashing down on the Cham's inferior Galeus and Triremes. Where is the Wapagong Armada now, you ask? Well, curious reader, it is right here where we left it, relentlessly bombarding what is left of the Japanese cities. I always like to be positive with all the different civs, but Meiji and his empire of the rapidly setting sun is looking to be in a pretty dire position. They can only but hope to hold on to Osaka, maybe the only defensible spot they have against the Australian onslaught. Ingolfer of Iceland finally decides to put his beautifully colored navy to use, which would be exciting had he pointed it the right way. I guess moving all of those ships through a one-tile gap to fight the Canadians would be too time-consuming, even though they're AI, who have no other commitment other than to be AI. Then again, trying to funnel through all of those units to Finland would, be also, would also be difficult and time-consuming. Maybe Ingolfer just wanted to be relevant and get a slide without actually doing anything. 
In a rarely seen culture overview screen, we can see just how much Australia is leading in tourism. Perhaps this is not so important in a domination only game, but having everyone convert to your ideology is more likely to make friends than enemies, for a few turns at least. Afghanistan, the only Civ that has chosen order so far, is happy for now, but soon, soon, be swarmed by free people who really, really just want to be oppressed by an autocratic regime. Henry Parks of Australia hasn't even finished ripping through Japan and yet makes his next target very clear. Turtle ships are strong and Admiral Yi is a damn good commander, but the turtle can only hold against the Wapagong for so long. I assume this is the case. Wapagongs look weird, so I wouldn't want to be touching one, let alone fighting one. As an American, I have no idea what the hell a Wapagong is. The nut of Urgench is cracked by the Himalayan army. Timer decides to send a trickle of units up to repel the Tibetans, though to no great effect. Timer is in a pickle of a situation right now. Any full commitment on any fronts leaves a mushy center empire exposed to those who wish to take a bite. From this picture, it seems the Siberians have exchanged a walk on part in the war for a lead role in working the fields. That rifleman looks pretty threatening, though. Nzinga of Congo has decided that Morocco is long overdue for some autumn spirit and sends over a load of leaves to help get Ahmed in the mood. These leaves have swords, however. Can you imagine leaves with swords? Imagine stepping on a sword leaf. Ouch. Anyway, in other news, Napoleon finds Tigan Darkhan sleepy in his embassy and gets mad. He screams something in French about guerre, but Darkhan just rolls over in his sleep and snores deeply. Lincoln finally finds someone less than his own size to pick on and declares war on Sitting Bull. Maybe, just maybe, he's have a chance at winning this battle. If only the only Sioux City was not an icy hell way out of Lincoln's reach. In other news, the Nazis and Soviets make peace. Molotov cocktails are thrown in large numbers that night. Mexico hops right in the autocratic automobile, only going forward, cause reverse means being shot for deserting your army. Mexico is rapidly becoming a technological leader in this area of the Americas. The Texans, who were once pretty scary, now look slightly weaker compared to the heavily Gatling gunned up Mexican army. We receive intel from the most trusted sources that the bloodthirsty Henry Parks, his car right on top of you, Parks, is planning on not only crushing and making turtle soup out of the Korean Navy, but also annexing the beautiful islands of Hawaii into his empire. It may be wise for Kamehameha to move those fancy, unique units from the Americas and bring them to protect the homeland. Semiramis brings us less interesting news, telling us that Hotak plans to ho attack the remaining legion of the Roman Empire. Maybe focusing your anger towards your more immediate neighbors would yield better results, though I am not a wise AI, so I would not know. Back to Central Europe now, where the Swedes seem to be everywhere. Poland and Germany seem to be getting along just fine, with regular trading with Wuj occurring with France. Irrelevant. Wuj is actually pronounced nothing like Lads. It's more like Wuj. I hope you didn't know this already, as I have just wasted your time. If it wasn't for this irrelevant comment, Curly Snail, I would not know how to pronounce that, and I would just pre keep pronouncing it Lods, so thanks. Ah, the Greater Emerald Isle. As a Welshman, this slide is about the best I could have hoped for for the Battle Royale. Sorry, England. Okay, not really. I suspect Ireland will see a lull in foreign activity now, which is a good thing, as they need to build back a good navy, just in case the Icelandic decide that the lands they can support cities greater than one pop are good. The Carthaginians are slowly pushing back the Ayyubids, though it seems that Hannibal of Carthage and his swift conquests are starting to slow down. If Saladin of the Ayyubids can form a nice and quick pike carpet, then he might be able to stop the elephants in their large, plodding tracks. You know, I asked my dog Mambo at the start of the Royale who he thought would win, and he just barked. I called him a silly Hannibal Barca. Get it? Like Hannibal Barca? Did you get it? Okay. Onto more serious stuff. The War of the Icy Worlds continues to blizzard on. Darkon is making some gains in the south of Kamchatka, though the Ice Sheet fleet has arrived in the east, and those Yakutian cities along the coast look woefully undefended and unprepared for a full-on frigate invasion. Like Oda Nobunaga, Meiji reunites the island of Japan, save Nagoya, under one banner again. This development does not look like it is going to last, as Parks is hungry for more Godsaki and the Japanese are pouring out Godsaki by the barrelful. 
Once again, Elizabeth decides to make more enemies and declares war on Finland. The Finnish have yet to deploy their unique unit yet. Then again, they are probably just planning to go on holiday in the USSR for some sweet free experience. Can I just say, and I'm sorry for the bias, that the USSR have been really, really disappointing so far. I mean, I'm rooting for them until the end, but they have so much potential that they don't use. At least in this reality, Stalin had the sense to use his great generals rather than kill them. Australian land has become so full up with either the might of the Wobegon or of rivers of Vegemite that some of the navy and army hangs about near Antarctica. You can't really see where the ships are going, though it looks like the Maori Maori, I'm sorry, should be scared. Then again, Australia may beat the Maori in a war, but sure can't beat them in rugby. Sorry, t -Pang. Alert, alert, the Boers have finally decided to use their massive tech advantage in Africa and actually go after someone. While Nzinga's back was turned, Kruger of the Boers realized the time to strike was now. Lime versus Orange is now go, and it's looking fairly unfavorable for the Limes. Kakonga is sure to be f uh, to fall at least, slowly merging and fixing the border gore of Africa. The capital of Japan is now merely a single house atop a hill, but that won't stop them from fighting for it. I think I see a samurai as well as a musket, but it all seems too late for Meiji. Mao's Chinese Red Dead Army looks to be on its last legs. Mao fought valiantly, defying all odds of survival for this long. However, it looks like Vietnam is about to deliver the killing blow. Cannons and muskets and Gatling guns versus composite bowmen and pikes. Chairman Mao will soon be saying Chairman Ao after the Trung sisters of Vietnam have their way. Yar, here be the black spot of the Caribbean, where all the empires come to die under the hand of Henry Morgan. Well, only the Mayans have so far, but you get the picture. All those Corsairs are beginning to look very, very scary, and any nation with a coastal city in the region would do well to be weary. The most exciting thing in this photograph is that a few units near the Macha Fortaleza border have been exchanging fire. Wait! Actually, it appears that the Argentinians have made some musket men. Forgive me if this has already been commented on. There is not much else to talk about in South America right now. Then again, the Chileans who were looking to be really strong are actually falling behind along a border they may need to fight along again. While the Incas are fielding crossbows, O'Higgins of Chile elects to use composite bowmen. Not much progress in the Lime Orange War so far. This is quite surprising actually as the majority of the Congo's leaf army is surrounding Mapong of Morocco, leaving vast swaths of Congo land empty for the Boer units to move into. If you look on the bottom right of the screen though, it seems like the Boers are more interested in Kakongo than anything else. Blimey, old Liz sure wants to go out with a bang, denouncing Norway. Maybe she's mad they let Portugal get it. Norway seems too focused on Hamburg to care. Swedish forces are also massing greatly near what seems like one of Poland's port cities. Back to Urgench now, where Timer has managed to repel the Tibetans, at least for now. It still looks dire for Timer in this region, as he simply cannot maintain a presence in the mountains the Tibetans call their home. The Kimberley decide not to anger their green neighbors and follow autocracy. Keeping Australia on their side for now seems like a good move, as although they have better technology on land, they simply do not have the numbers. Also, look at all the Wabagong in reserve. It's insane. If the Kimberley want to remain strong and relevant, then maybe a war against Indonesia would be profitable. It may be slow at the start, but once they break through the masses of caravels, they can snake through the archipelago, snatching cities like an aboriginal Cthulhu. The Swedish continue to push into Polish and German land quickly and with force while Hakan of Norway slowly but surely chips away at Hamburg. The Finns look like they are holding back any further assault while the Soviet workers of the world have united to try and invade Poland too. However, not many military units means they cannot do anything. Hannibal also makes it to the Renaissance era. Elephants can't be good forever now, can they? Australia, though having the most tourism overall, does not hold the title of the city most people like to visit. This may be because they all smell of Vegemite and play land down under 24-7. Curiously, Paris has the same amount of tourism as is given by the Eiffel Tower. While some Inuit children were throwing snow into each other's mouths to eat, one of them flung some snow coal. They later realized that snow coal was not chocolate and could burn it. Too long didn't read, Inuit enter the industrial era. Lincoln, despite being a fairly small empire, is ahead of a lot of Civ's technological curve and enters the industrial era himself. Shame this won't help him become relevant at all. Ah, Afghanistan, the land devoid of any units and a seemingly invisible city, Lakshagar. 
Just north of the Invisible City, Hotak builds something that is not an army, seeking world peace through the wonders of art. Sadly, this is not going to happen. He can dream, though. He even builds the Taj Mahal. He sure is dreaming pretty hard. Build some units. Also, I love how there are two summer cons in this picture. Must be getting pretty confusing for the residents of these two nations. Japan is briefly united once more. Some of the sea-able Korean ships have broken out to harass the Australians. However, it does not seem like this will serve to do anything more than stall the inevitable Japanese loss of their homeland. In the north, the Inuit and Yakutia continue to battle it out. The Yakutians are playing purely defensive, and in an environment like this one that they live in, they are very well defended. Who wants to move an army through a ton of ice and snow? I mean, I know the Inuit eat it, but I can't imagine it being a nice place to fight. A better look at the war now. The Inuit seem to have finally hauled most of their army through Alaska and into Kamchatka. Cannons and muskets aplenty. If Darkon can hold the line behind Igluk, then he can prevent big cities like Itikalulul from being in danger. If I can bash on the Inuit a little more, they still have not upgraded their army. I've criticized Chile for still using composite bowmen, and the Inuit are no exception. Now, forgive me if I'm wrong, T-Pang, but the garrison artillery is available through JFD's and Pukai's mercenaries mod. It could actually be Canada's unique unit, but I might just be wrong. Anyway, if they are strong, then they surely give Canada a leg up in what seems to be a relevant balance of power in North America. T-Pang, please help. T-Pang's help. Yeah, we recently updated Canada and can the garrison artillery and replaced it with a super awesome, awesome Hudson's Bay company. You can still purchase the garrison artillery and the Avro Arrow as mercenary contracts in the Mercenaries mod. The fairly large polar city of Krakow is starting to crack under the pressure of the Swedish army. The Finns have also started to mobilize their army towards the Polish heartland. You can't call it a heartland, really. It's all close to the edge. It's all Skinland. Berlin also looking to be in danger of Gustavus Adolphus, Sweden, reclaiming the surname Adolf, though no damage has been done to the capital of the Reich just yet. Boom. The hammer of the gods drives Swedish ships to new lands to snipe the cities, singing and crying, Hitler, we are coming, yeah! Much to the dismay of the Norwegians, I may add. They were trying so hard to not be branded Snorway, but now, unless they want to attack Ireland or Sweden, will be confined back to their old habits. Gustavus looks to be finally earning his name, the Lion of the North, even looking poised to pounce and take Krakow for good. An Australian scout scouts out Henry Park's far future empire. For now, the scout thinks they will just introduce them to the wonders of Vegemite and giant spiders. Hey look, more chip Wait, 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 wait. How have Australia got a turtle ship? Either the Australians through years of mutation through long sun exposure have gained the ability to shapeshift, or the ships of the Wapagong have so much experience they now have the prize ship's promotion. Either reality is equally as disturbing. The Trung sisters make their move into China. With their army now consisting of riflemen, I would officially call Mao some kind of super AI to withstand such a brutal onslaught. The only thing worse than the world would be the flail of God swung towards Mao's head. By this, I mean many Mongolian units pouring into Chinese cities. Should have built that wall, Mao. Tibet seems to have firmly cemented Urgench into their empire and seem to be trying to attack Nishapur. Going at this with a single composite bowman may not yield good results, though. Also, either the Huns are friendly and have open borders with Timur, or the Huns now send workers into battle. Tus better watch out, or Attila is going to build a very mean statue at the base of Tus. Afghanistan joins the new fad of settling snow cities in the south. Tala Khan is a prime destination of Afghan citizens who want something more than the warm, too saccharine land of Afghanistan. Why they would choose a snowy outcrop over somewhere where blood can run without being frozen, I don't know. But they seem to like it so much they've sent another settler down. In Africa news, Hannibal finally cracks Bill Base. The Kimberley decide to expand further into the icy Antarctic waters, potentially as an escape plan for if Australia overwhelms them. There is a lot of fish pearls south of Wollongara, though, so don't immediately write this expansion off as a useless one just yet. The commandos surround Kakongo, the city's only defense being a lonely scout. It won't be long before Kakongo falls and Kruger can turn his attention outwards, potentially to the Congo capital. Since it's the Zulu's turn, now would be a time to mention that it would be a really good time for Shaka to declare war on the Congo again, but I'm pretty sure he won't. The AI is like that, you see. 
The slow and grinding Cartago bid war becomes so dragged out that the Hano the Navigator gets old and fights for the war as Hano the Elder. Carthage has a huge, compared to the size of the Mediterranean, navy, and could easily overwhelm Sparta if he was that way inclined. The Spartans may be fierce on the ground, but Gallius vs. Caravels might not end well for the non-ranged ships. It seems like Otak plans for more than building wonders, but if Semiramis was wrong about Afghanistan's war against the last remaining Roman legion, we may have reason to doubt his prediction. A Timurid war would probably not result in too much, too many mountain passes to go through which the Timurids could easily defend even with their smallish army. I would love to say something relevant is happening in the slide, as the fact that the Boers are making ground in the Congo is more interesting than India right now. I guess the fact that Sri Lanka now has a decent land army, go to war with the Mughals, and that Sengenzangbo, Vietnam, has fallen into the deep yellow is pretty interesting. Shout out to Mughal Nation! And here we are. The Boers have now turned their forces outward and have begun an assault of the border Congo cities. Orange Group South heads towards Kambasa and potentially on to Mbenzanga, Congo, while Orange Group North leads to the lightly defended city of Gondar. For some reason, despite surrounding Mampang with units, Nzinga has not yet issued an order to damage the city. You would think 12 leaves would be able to cut through a couple of composite bowmen really quickly. Apparently not. The assault on Japan just doesn't stop. The vicious Australians destroying cities over and over and over again just to have a lone musketman take it back. You have to hand it to the Japanese though, they're not giving up without a fight. The Vietnamese and Chinese forces dance around each other like two mighty dragons fighting in the sky. This would be majestic until you imagine that one is a slightly podgy dragon with a Chairman Mao mask on. <sighs> Watch Alum and Sendai are magically still in Yakushin gloved hands. Some Inuit privateers seem to break through the stalemate only to be pushed back out again. Repeat ad infinitum. It's also interesting that even if the Inuit break through the Yakut's front line, Darkhan has hidden more in reserve, way up in the icy northern wastes. Bell base has been flipping back and forth between Carthage and the Ayyubids for the past forever, it seems. So much so that the people of that city are now half green and half yellow. Crazy, huh? The Swedes surely have not calmed the tides of war in this part and have only served to make them bigger. Krakow is now in Swedish hands. Sweden's SAS, some assembly required, have finally come out of what looked like an irrelevant and hopeless situation and have turned themselves into a potential European leader. Maybe not though. The Finns still look foreboding and they've just made peace with Poland, leaving Sparta to nibble the last remains of Casimir's fallen empire. Stalin's army has reappeared, heading towards Attila's court, while the Huns are fairly weak after their crippling war with Sibir. I don't know if Stalin's army seems like it's a decent size, or if it's just the fact that there are a ton of workers. Soviet core cities are big though, there is that. Speaking of Stalin, the Man of Steel figures out how to smelt stuff en masse, and then gets a lot of volunteers, quote unquote, in his northern labor camps to build factories to usher in a new age of communism, or autocracy, just like everyone else. Morgan is becoming fed up with the fact that a civilization as weak as America can survive in America and begins to plot Lincoln's demise. Lincoln may be in the industrial era, but his ships are sure not advanced enough for an assault on the scale of the Buck's Ken Buck. Speaking of poor navies, the Maple Flotilla is also pretty flimsy compared to their seafaring neighbors up north. The Australians seem fed up with wasting the full force of the Wapagong Armada on constantly retaking cities from rogue samurai and muskets, and so bring some land units to take care of them. The Japanese may want to open peace talks now, though this may not be possible as the glorious beard of Henry Parks has grown so thick and wild, no sound can permeate it. Alcohol can still drain through it though, don't worry about that. Akbar of the Mughals watches Poland falling from atop a large mountain and decides he should declare war on poor Casimir, who is already being kicked repeatedly by the Spartans. Revenge for that scout, maybe? Who knows? I think there was a flower or something. The Swedish now have a taste for blood and are not stopping at Hamburg. Burgers are nice, but the really meaty land lies in Berlin and in Central Europe. Should Gustav want to continue to be successful in his conquests, Berlin would be a fine and strategic prize. Oh, and rip Hitler, I guess. Remember those Australian scouts in Texas? Well, the Texans love the Australians' violent accounts of war, and the Australians love the Texans' gun shops so much that they both became good friends. Japan is still hanging on for dear life. With no wars to fight, the Finns' army spreads across their territory. All those guns look terrifying, and as a USSR supporter, in-game, not real life, I should be pretty scared. We're bros, though. 
right? And now to conclude this part, Bernardo has had enough of the Kex dooming the future of civilization and declares the most relevant war of this part. Ah, now we come to the numbers part of the slides. The Maori are edging out ahead in population, mostly the usual suspects here. While slap bang at the bottom, we have the Sioux and Poland. Poland just lost a size 17 city. Ouch. The Australians stay on top while Finland climbs ever higher. And Poland is now the weakest living nation. I wouldn't be surprised if they fall soon. I swear the slide is reused every part. Here we see all of the sieves that are tottering on the edge of total destruction. I wonder how the Sioux are doing against the Inuit. The Boers out-tech even Korea. Bad news for the Congo who is already suffering early into the war. The Soviet Union is peeking out at the bottom there though. Carthage, though looking strong, is still not making any tech progress. And last, but not least, dot 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 dot, the religion map. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this part like I enjoyed writing it. Don't forget to swing by Civ Battle Royale for your fix of original content and speculation in between each part. There are some awesome people there. And my name is Dawkins. Thank you for joining me for the audio narration. We'll see you next time.